Coming up on Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to be talking about the iPad Mini with Retina. What the heck is G Sync, the Galaxy Note? A whole lot more. Is there even a contest detail in here? Yeah, I think so. Coming up. It's rock and the bench marks. We're going to up the ante uh, just a little bit. Processing power. I kind of understand this. Hey folks, welcome back to Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Ayaz Akhtar alongside Dave Altavilla and the very deep-voiced Marco Cipetta. Let me ask Marco, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay, baby. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I don't know why I have to have a southern accent when I do that, but I have to. How about you, Dave? It's really great to be here. Don't go changing. I also turned into a trucker during that as well. <laughs> So I don't sound like that. We 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 aren't uh, people to uh, discuss ourselves constantly. This is hot hardware's two and a half geeks. We talk about the hottest hardware. We should start up with the uh, iPad Mini with Retina display. When the iPad first, the iPad Mini came out. First thing everyone thought was, "I'm gonna wait till next year when they have a Retina display." Dave, what did you find out about it? I wanted to talk about you the whole show. Oh, that's totally Jeez. doable. You know, I like long walks on the beach. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I was supposed to be a Virgo, but I was actually a Libra. And we should stop talking about me. Pina <laughs> coladas and yeah. True okay. Story. Well, yeah, let's talk about I, uh, Apple's little iPad mini here and um, give you the, the quick and dirty on it. We, we gave it a hot hardware approved. We like it. It's a, a solid product. It is a um, 7.9 inch um, Tablet actually not quite a seven, not quite a, an eight inch tablet, uh, but is it is their second generation iPad Mini. It has the twenty forty eight by fifteen thirty six resolution Retina display, and it is powered by Apple's new A seven sixty four bit processor clocked at uh, one point three gigahertz, uh, slightly uh, hundred megahertz lower clock speed than uh, the iPad Air, um, Power VR sixty four thirty uh, quad core graphics, the same. Graphics that's in the A7 chip for the iPad Air and the iPhone 5S, incidentally, and a gig of RAM. 399 MSRP for the 16 gig Wi Fi only variant. Um, liked it in general. As always, Apple build quality is excellent. App, Apple ecosystem and apps and software in terms of iOS 7, excellent. Um, but, you know, we expected more, certainly for the price, and there's a couple of um, caveats that I, I think Apple has been missing for a long time now that we're just not going to give them a pass for anymore. And the display, believe it or not, isn't the best in market either anymore. So there's the quick and dirty. Now, if you want to dig in some more, we can. We should. <laughs> the thing is, I've, I've heard a lot about the, the 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 Mini with Retina. I'd been looking into that since the original Mini came out. Uh, yeah. Apple did up the resolution to the point where effectively it's supposed to be about the same. I think it's the exact same resolution as the larger iPad, the iPad Air. So a lot right. more dense uh, uh, pixel density there, actually. But the thing yep. is, I've seen I've seen a lot of reports out there saying the Kindle HDX, and, the, and there's a lot of other devices that basically make the iPad uh, Mini look like a joke. Yeah, I don't know if you could say a joke. I mean, it's still, you know, we are still impressed with, with their high-resolution display. It's a, it's a really nice IPS panel. There's no question about it. However, there are better displays on the market currently. Uh, you mentioned the Kindle Fire HDX. They, uh, Amazon actually um, has a better display in that. It is, um, I'm trying to think what their technology is, um, but the uh, HDX7 and um, the 8.9-inch version of the ATX have a wider 100% color gamut, so you get much more vibrant, accurate colors on that display than you do on the 63% color gamut um, iPad mini. Uh, and it was interesting, you know, we, our, our editor, uh, Ray Willington, um, you know, gave it praise for its display and, and a few of our readers chimed in and I agreed with them about um, the display coming up a little bit short versus some of the other um, higher end tablets in the market. Um, the, in, in, in the case of the Kindle Fire HDX, the 7-inch HDX is a 1920 by 1200 display, so 323 PPI pixel density there. But again, 100% sRGB color gamut, um, and so it is beautiful. And when you look at some of the other displays, like the AMOLED displays from Samsung that are on the market, even they um, outperform the iPad mini. And so, 
you know, you can get a Kindle Fire HDX, for example, right now, a 16 gig Kindle Fire HDX for $229 versus a $399 iPad mini. And yeah, the seven inch version is a little bit smaller than the iPad, 0.9 inches to be exact. The 8.9 inch version you can get for $379. So 20 bucks less for a much larger, nicer display. 2560 by 1600 res on that version for $20 less than an iPad mini. There's just too much competition. The Nexus 7 right now, uh, Nexus 7 for 2013, uh, Google Nexus 7, beautiful display. Also, uh, a 7-inch, slightly smaller tablet than the iPad mini, but blows the iPad mini out of the water. The other thing that I take issue with is Apple's insistence of not including any expansion whatsoever except for that... um, uh, their their proprietary port. Uh, I'm blanking on a Thunderbolt lightning port. Connector. Lightning connector. Thank you. That was the word. It's a Thunderbolt port, but uh, the lightning connector. Um, yeah. So, you know, why don't we have an SD card slot by now? It's, there's just, you know, these days there's just too much competition. The market's too heavily saturated, especially in this class of smaller tablets. There's just a ton of them on the market, and they're better. Um, no one can match, and you know. Again, you know, want to want to underscore this. No company currently has the ecosystem, the number of apps, the absolutely packed, you know, app store that Apple has. No question about it. And iOS seven is pretty rock solid. It's an excellent OS. But beyond that, the hardware, what we really care about here at Hot Hardware, falls a little bit short comparatively. Yeah, it's a much more crowded field than it used to be when it comes to tablets, especially in that smaller space. Apple famously saying they would never make a 7-inch tablet. They'd have to file your fingers down for that. Of course, their device is almost 8 inches, and that's why it's supposed to be better. Um, well, it, it's it's out there. You know the next generation will be better. It seems like this is Apple's slow progression at this point because they don't seem to be doing crazy things to upset the Apple cart. You know, yeah, that's, that. that's kind of what, you know, and, and unfortunately Apple has to live with their successful, you know, breakout lineage, you know, where they've come from. And people expect amazing things from Apple. And, you know, this isn't so amazing. (laughs) Let's talk about amazing things. Then Let's talk about NVIDIA G-Sync. Now, surprisingly, I read like the entire article that Marco put up about G-Sync and distinguishing it between V-Sync is even an eight minute in-depth video explaining how it works we should kind of tell the audience what the heck we're talking about in case they have no idea. Marco, <laughs> tell me about, in the audience, about NVIDIA's G-Sync technology. So in, NVIDIA's G-Sync technology, it, it, it's awesome, in, in, to put it into the simplest of terms. So every PC gamer since the dawn of PC gaming has basi- basically had two choices. There are some other modes now available with modern graphics cards. But basically, when you were gaming on a PC, you could play with V-Sync on, which is vertical sync, or V-Sync off. Now, what, v- what V-Sync on does is it synchronizes or attempts to synchronize the output from your graphics card with the screen's refresh process. So your graphics card draws a frame, spits it out to the display, the display draws that on the screen, Typically, the most common refresh rate on monitors today is 60 hertz. So 60 times a second, it's updated with a frame from the display. Now, if V-Sync is turned on and the graphics card, let's say, is capable of doing 120 frames per second, but it's dipping down below 30 frames per second, you end up with this kind of funky situation where either the display has to show the same frame twice where basically that's visualized as as stutter so for that brief moment you see the same frame and it the animation stops so you perceive it as stutter or you have all this extra performance left on the table that results in you know the other thing to mention is you end up with lag when the screen has to display multiple frames more than once. You, know, you end up with input lag. Now, with VSync off, you think, well, shut VSync off. That's going to fix it. Now, that introduces a whole other set of problems. With VSync off, you end up with what's called tearing very often. It eliminates lots of the lag. But if your graphics card is spitting out frames faster than your monitor can draw them, sometimes you end up with portions of two or more frames on the screen and they don't perfectly align because things are in motion when you're playing. Now, NVIDIA's G-Sync fixes all that and it, it's, it's really a, a smart way to do this and something that should have happened a long time ago. What G-Sync does 
is it takes away that fixed 60, 60 hertz refresh rate in the monitor or whatever the fixed refresh rate is in your monitor. And it allows the graphics card to control the timing. So let's say you're playing whatever the game, you're playing Battlefield 4 and your frame rate's going from you know 32 frames per second, 45 frames per second, back down to 30 frames per second, up to 60. No matter what your frame rate is between 30 hertz and up to 144 hertz, the graphics card can alter the timing on the fly of the display so you have minimal or no lag and absolutely no tearing. And it's something that when you see it live, it's like, oh, wow, you're going to need that. Yeah, but you need a lot of specialized components here, right? You need to have, I believe it's a Kepler-based GPU. You need to have DisplayPort. You need to have a monitor that has G-Sync. Uh, is this something you think that people are going to accept over time, or do you think this is some kind of uh, a, a really niche kind of product? Um, I think at first it's going to be a niche kind of product because, yeah, there there are requirements um, that not everybody's going to meet. Like you said, you need a Kepler-based uh, graphics card, GTX 650 or higher, and you'll also need a monitor with the G-Sync module. Now, starting at least through the end of the year, there's I'm, I'm forgetting the model number of the monitor, but there's a particular uh, ASUS monitor and a upgrade module that you can buy if you want to upgrade it yourself. And system builders are going to be going to be offering G-Sync uh, enabled this same ASUS monitor with pre-built systems. Now, it's also you know it's a proprietary tech, so everyone with AMD graphics cards or Intel graphics cards as of now, you're kind of left out in the cold. So, yeah, it's going to be a small a, a slow adoption rate at first, but it's the kind of technology that just improves the experience all around. You know, and as a side benefit. The, the G-Sync module that NVIDIA has developed, it, it's capable of resolutions up to 4K and refresh rates up to 144 hertz. And if you switch, even if you're not a gamer, if you switch from a 60 hertz panel to a 144 hertz panel, everything on screen is just more fluid, moving windows, your mouse cursor movements. It's actually a noticeable thing, even though it's tough to quantify. So there's there are benefits from just upgrading your monitor tech. So I think it's the kind of thing that when you experience it, you'll really want it, especially if you're particular about your games and graphics. This this thing sounds to me, and 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 if I could just jump in real quick, I mean, it, I mean, Marco, you you saw this live. You've you've been playing with it, you know, yourself, and um, it's it's that impressive to to know in action that it, it really feels like, you know, almost like industry standard sort of adoption quality of, of technology. In other words, it's it's so much better than a standard, you know, V-Sync software switch um, and that old implementation that we've been living with all these years that, you know, it sounds like, you know, it would take, I mean, obviously it's an NVIDIA proprietary technology, but what I'm getting at here is, is it is it patented and would we see NVIDIA perhaps in the future license this technology or... Or p- could perhaps AMD and Intel and, and others um, invent their own method of achieving the same uh, technology and the same result with, with the graphics card and the monitor? So lots of questions there. Um, last I spoke to NVIDIA about it, it, it is, it's technically open. So if someone else wanted to support it, they could, at least at this point. But, you know, physics was open and you see what happens there. Nobody's supporting it but NVIDIA. So yeah. I wouldn't expect anybody but NVIDIA to support this version. Now, the, the G-Sync module right now, I, I, have, I also should say I'm not sure what they patented as part of this tech. There may be patents involved. I'm just not sure. Now, but the, the G-Sync module, it, it's not a custom ASIC right now. It's using an FPGA that's been programmed. And I really would not be surprised if that's already been reversed, uh, reverse engineered by other labs and they now see how it works and how to do it and the software has already been in nvidia's drivers for a while and the way it works or the way it behaves is similar to nvidia's adaptive vsync tech which has been out for a while so all of the concepts are probably familiar to other graphics companies whether or not this becomes a standard and something that gets incorporated into future monitors and supported across the board i'm not sure i don't have the answers just yet it's just too early I will say it should happen if everybody is smart about this and you know doesn't get into a, a pissing match over it. <laughs> yeah, because it's that it's that impressive. 
It's before, that good. Before we leave it this is. topic, Mark, I want to ask you something. Is this something you just can't unsee once you've seen this? You're like, everything else looks horrible. Yes, we've actually, um, after the article went live, I'm going to put a link at the end of the article and I'll put it in the show notes when we post this. NVIDIA sent over a 60 frames per second video. That Now, we can't host it on YouTube because it breaks to 60 frames per second. But we have a download link in, in the article. If you download this video and you watch it on your PC in a, in a 60 frames per second capable player and you see the difference in animation between standard display and G-Sync, you're going to go, why did I put up with all that crap for all these years? Why does my $1,000 GTX Titan have to output to a display using a technology developed you know, almost 100 years ago? So it just makes sense that this gets updated and it fixes so many issues that I hope it, I hope the adoption is strong and I hope other people incorporate similar tech or it becomes or evolves into some sort of standard that all monitors uh, offer in the future. That's definitely one of my favorite kinds of tech when you're like, why didn't we do this before? That's my favorite <laughs> kind. Uh, let, let's uh, let's go back to the tablet beast because apparently, Dave, that's what you're covering today. You've got uh, a review up, or at least there's a review in hot hardware, uh, about the Samsung Galaxy Note 10.1 2014 edition. Is that actually the right one, or did I uh, misread the, the actual date? That's correct. That's correct. It's the uh, 2014 edition. I don't know why Samsung went with that in their infinite wisdom, but... I guess it was a late year launch, and uh, they wanted to say this is new. It's it's really new, and so and you have yeah the, the Galaxy Note 10.1 2014 edition. Uh, it is the latest 10 uh, inch slate from Samsung. It is the their high end 10 inch slate, complete with a digitizer and pen integrated into the design. It's based on a 2.3 gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon 800 uh, quad core SoC with their very fast Adreno 330 graphics on board. And um, uh, that is easily one of the fastest uh, tablets and smartphone processes in the market currently. Um, perhaps trading victories with Apple's uh, A7, actually. Um, probably the only thing about uh, as fast or faster, depending on the application. And a really high res 2560 by 1600 10.1 inch display, which is beautiful. It's a super clear LCD technology by Samsung, and it is gorgeous. It runs Android 4.3 Jelly Bean with Samsung TouchWiz on board, and uh, it is a big, beautiful tablet. Now, that, that display, apparently that LCD is <coughs> a crazy resolution, and there is, a, I think you said Snapdragon uh, 800 processor in there? Yep. Right. Now, yep. How is the performance? Because I know that Samsung has all of its touch whiz skin. I'm like, well, what's the word I want to use here? It's not a swear. Uh, and, <laughs> and I know they have a multi-window mode. Could this, <coughs> could this device actually successfully do multi-window mode with a display like that and with a processor like that? <clears throat> Excuse me. You, you were making me cough with your, with your hint of, of cursing. Um, well, you know, to be honest, we did notice a little bit of lag with the tablet, although I don't think it was attributed to TouchWiz. Our hunch is um, this is a really high-res display. It's a 2560 by 1600 display. Um, you also have a pen interface and a digitizer integrated into the display as well. So there are times when perhaps, whether you're touching it with your, with your finger or a pen, where you don't get the quite instantaneous response that you would get with, um, you know, perhaps a non-integrated uh, tablet uh, or touch integrated, excuse me, uh, digitizer integrated display. Um, but we also think maybe there was there was a little bit of um, re-rendering, uh, you know, lag going on at that super high res, at 2560 by 1600 res. I mean, you know, I I'm talking to you right now and I'm looking at a 30 inch you know, Dell monitor with a 2560 by 1600 res, just to give you an idea. I mean, it's no joke. So there, there was definitely a little bit of lag. I've actually had some hands-on time with this device. Uh, Ray Wellington looked at it for us as well and did the full review. Um, it's a really nice tablet. It, it is fast. I mean, there are certain applications, certainly gaming, certainly, um, you know, even simple stuff like, like web browsing and stuff like that, you know, opening up apps and, 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 and starting and, and multitasking, as, as you noted, handles pretty well on the device. But you do see occasionally, whether it be a, a touch of input lag, just occasionally, or screen redraw, especially when you're doing things like reorientating the display, you know, not quite as snappy as uh, perhaps a, a lower res uh, device like a 1920 uh, by 1200 display. 
And so that's our hunch. Uh, we can't really put our finger on why there's a little bit of lag, but it is there. There's also the question of build quality. It's about, I believe, $500. Spending $500 for a tablet. <clears throat> uh, Samsung moving away from their chintzy plastic. I believe they have a like a leather-like backing. Is that right? Yeah, it's actually a, it's a really nice um, uh, leather textured finish, I guess, uh, what I would call pleather uh, backing. Um, but, you know, where pleather might conjure up, um, you know, visions of, of not so high quality, it's actually a very high quality feeling tablet. Um, it has a sort of a chrome trim ring around the edge. I really liked it. Um, you know, it is very thin. It's very light. Um, and, yeah, 16 gig for 499 32 gig for 549 MSRP. Um, they're selling pretty well. I think it's a solid tablet if you're if you have to do a little bit more than the average Joe in terms of consumption. You know, maybe you've got some other duties you want to you want to uh, take over with that pen and digitizer. There's folks that that do some some real work on on some of these tablets whether it be in the field or whether it be in the office. Um you know, there's a little bit more utility going on here than than the average consumption slate, if you will. Okay, so we should move on to the world of hard drives. Because, Marco, you got a review up right now of the WD Black 2 Dual SSD in, in hard drive. It's a, it's a hybrid drive. Uh, it looks like they married a 120-gigabyte SSD with a 1-terabyte spinning drive and a really tiny form factor. What did, what did you find out about this thing? Yes, it's actually... It, it's. There's no other product like it. Let me pick it up first and, and show it to you guys. So, <clears throat> so here it is. As you can see, it looks just like any other two and a half inch drive. See how thin it is? There's the bottom. Single SATA interface back here. So yeah, it's in essence, it's it's exactly what you explained. There is a, a 120 gigabyte SSD and a one terabyte hard drive, all in this single two and a half inch form factor with a 9.5 millimeter Z height. But it uh, Western Digital did more than just kind of bolt two drives together. So when you plug this into a system for the very first time, when it just comes out of the box, it's actually partitioned just as a 120 gig SSD. So you plug it in. Let's say you either want to migrate stuff from an existing <coughs> hard drive or you want to just do a fresh OS installation onto it. Boom, you have that 120 gig SSD, install it. All of your stuff is on the fastest part of the drive. Then Western Digital requires you to run this utility, which essentially unlocks the one terabyte drive. And then it can be partitioned and used, you know, as any other hard drive would. If you were to look at this drive in Windows, you know, the way it's set up out of the box and when you unlock that one terabyte portion, it has two drive letters and it works like two drives. However, if you were to manually wipe out all the partitions, it's actually recognized by the OS as a 1.12 terabyte single drive. So it's not like there's, you know, two drives just using this one SATA interface. Western Digital has worked a little magic where it's actually a single drive and the fastest portion, I have to back up for a second, something that... Um, Hardcore techs used to do back in the day was short stroking a hard drive. And what that meant was you, you created a much smaller partition on a larger drive. So everything in that first initial small partition was on the fastest part of the drive. They basically, when you short stroke the first 120 gig drives, you're putting everything on the SSD. And then the rest is on the hard drive. So it's kind of a real funky arrangement. But to pull it off, uh, WD had to make some concessions. The SSD is freaking tiny. It's like a little tiny portion on here. So it's not quite as fast as a standalone SSD. It's rated for um, 350 gig reads and 140 meg per second writes. The hard drive, though, though it's 5400 RPM, it's a single platter one terabyte drive. So that's actually four hard drive. <clears throat> pretty fast. It does about 115 to 140 uh, megabytes per second on the HD portion. The the kicker, though, is to get everything to fit in this little tiny form factor, this guy's 300 bucks. So it's not quite for everybody. You know, on a desktop, you could buy a 120 gig SSD and a, a two terabyte drive for less than this. But if you have a portable device that only has, or even an all-in-one that only has one two and a half inch drive bay, it kind of is a no compromise solution. You can get SSD like performance without compromising on capacity. Now you mentioned the idea that you could uh, make it one big drive 
Uh, I'm guessing that'd be a performance hit. Uh, I, I think... Actually, I'm not guessing. <laughs> I've read the article. I saw what happened. Mark, could you yeah. what happens if you accidentally combine these? Because it seems like a bad idea. Cheater. Yeah, so, yeah, it's it'll work. The drive will work. However, you you don't know where your data is going to go, so you may end up with, you know, let's say you throw a huge file on there with parts of the file on the in, on the SSD and parts on the HD, and it could kind of act really flaky. I, I posted a... Uh, a HT to an HD tuned benchmark with the drive set up as one giant partition, and you see this, you know, high performance SSD, <laughs> high performance SSD drop, you know, HD performance. So it, you know, it performs quickly up to the 120 gigabyte mark, and then it drops to hard drive speeds. So it it, it really should be configured with the two partitions, and that's why WD hides the HD the HDD partition out of the box. Now, assuming you don't screw that up and you keep them as separate, how was the performance compared to other things? You said three hundred bucks, a lot of money. Uh, d- does it does it uh, justify that cost? Sort of. Strictly in terms of performance, no, it doesn't just justify the cost. You know, what you have to remember is, as I mentioned, it's really it, there's a, a a core group of people that would benefit from a drive like this. If you have a laptop that you want to upgrade. And you don't have the money for, let's say, a 480 gig SSD or something larger, and, and you need the space, you're out of luck. You either get a large hard drive or a small SSD and deal with the smaller capacity. This answers that. Now, if you look at the benchmarks, it doesn't compare to really any of the modern SSDs. Any decent SSD you can buy today is basically saturating the SATA interface. And this drive does not. You're talking max 350 <laughs> megabyte per second sequential reads. However, if you, if you look at those synthetic benchmarks where it's just transferring data, it doesn't look so great. But if you look at a, a trace-based benchmark like, like um, PCMark, where it's actually measuring tasks you would perform in Windows, it's still slower, but it's not this huge gap. It still feels like you're using an SSD. It has that low latency, that snappy feeling that you feel when you're using an SSD. It's just it can't transfer large amounts of data as fast as a standalone SSD. That's really it. So now it's, it's the season, you know, it's, you know, in California, it's, it's not snowing. Uh, uh, there's, there's no leaves on the ground. I'm sure over <laughs> on the East coast where you guys are, it's probably more in season. So we're going to be, you know, giving away things at hot, at hot hardware. What, what's, uh, what's the latest contest over at hot hardware, Dave? You know, uh, before I, I I touch base on our contest, and and it is snowing out right now. We're getting about six inches of the fresh white stuff. <laughs> Dang it! So I got to get off this call pretty soon and and go out and snowblow. But um, I did want to make one little tease, one little plug tease um, for an upcoming article that you really have to check out. We're going to give an editor's choice to our friends at Lenovo for the Yoga Two Pro. Now I've, I've kind of let that cat out of the bag. It's it's that good. It's a new thirteen point three inch Ultrabook by Lenovo. It has an amazingly high res thirty two hundred by eighteen hundred QHD plus display touch display that is gorgeous. One hundred and seventy degree viewing angles, and it's built on Intel's Haswell. It's got a blazing fast one hundred twenty eight gig SSD. At least the version we tested, and so we'll have the full review up tomorrow. Actually, by the time you view this. You'll probably have the full review up, and uh, you got to stop by and check that one out. We really like it. It's it's one of the nicest ultra books we've seen yet, and uh, one to get this season from the folks at Lenovo. So if just stop by and check that out. Uh, and yes, in terms of sweepstakes, we have the Hot Hardware EVGA Tegra Note Tablet Holiday Giveaway that is wrapping up in the next couple of days. You have uh, mere hours, maybe maybe 36 or 48 tops to get in on this thing. Um, we are giving away uh, a pair of EVGA Tegra Notes tablets and $50 Google Play gift cards to go with it. And that is the, the Tegra Note that's based on NVIDIA's new Tegra 4 processor, quad core plus one uh, SOC with uh, 72 core uh, GeForce graphics on board as well. And so it's a really nice seven-inch slate, and uh, it's built by the folks at EVGA for NVIDIA, and we're giving away two of them to a couple of lucky winners, as well as a a third uh, runner-up can also win a $25 Google Play gift card as well. So there, there you have it. It Sounds like an awesome giveaway, and and a quick note on that yoga Two, yoga pro 2 or 2 pro i keep mixing up which in which yoga 2 is. pro yeah thank you i've actually tried out that device whose name escapes me and i was surprised uh because sometimes lenovo makes some really bad products and that 
was really, really well done. That display is yeah. unbelievable. Uh, it, it's one of those things that like we said earlier. Everything else looks bad now. So yeah, thanks. Lenovo. Keyboard's gorgeous too on the thing. It's yeah. just it's just beautiful built Even machine. Even the trackpad, oh. Windows Eight, very gesture based. <laughs> Trackpad's fantastic. Um, I'm sure your review is going to be all about that because all about it's it. Really good. And also, don't <laughs> forget, you can also get uh, that'll be up at uh, hothardware.com, right? That that Indeed. site, that little, yes. little site that can it has amazing content. Everything we talked about on today's show at hothardware.com, or you can go around the web. Let's go to Marco first. If they wanted to go to Facebook, where should they go? Facebook.com slash hot hardware. What about the Twitters, Dave? Twitter.com slash hot hardware, don't you know? What about Google Plus, me? Well, do a search for hot hardware on Google Plus. You'll find it. It's awesome there. What about email? You can <laughs> sign up. You can you can you can register on site. You wanna you want to scroll down to the left margin mm -hmm. and where it says subscribe to HH News Alerts. You can get on our Feed Blitz blast that goes out once a day and gives you all the highlights. And what about YouTube, Marco? YouTube.com slash hot hardware vids, I as. And if you're there, <laughs> click subscribe. Subscribe yes, to all yes. the videos because there's tons of reviews, other video content. And you can also watch old episodes of Two and a Half Geeks. You can watch when I have a buzz cut. When I have long hair, when I have short hair. When I had more hair. When Dave had more hair. When I knew very you little could, about graphics watch, cards. You can watch when, when I was fat and when I was fat and when I was fat. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Oh, stop it. <laughs> the thing Nobody I've, likes a skinny Santa anyways. The, the thing I've enjoyed most about this show is we're almost at the end of the year. I think we'll have one more episode for the end of the year. Uh, is that I've learned so much about something I've been so dense about for far too long. Thanks to Marco Cipetta. I'm going to be nice to you for once, so deal with it. Thank you, sir. I've learned a lot about graphics cards because normally I'm just like, uh, eh, graphics cards, but I'm like, oh, I understand them now. Uh, you can watch the quality of questions get better over the year at youtube.com slash hot hardware vids. <laughs> My first graphics cards are like, what are they, Marco? <laughs> <laughs> and they get a little bit better. And Dave, thanks to you for being there, just being there. Thank you for being uh, a friend. Thanks for being you as well, Ayaz. It's been singing. a pleasure, and we look forward to geeking with you in the new year. I'm going to start singing the Golden Girls theme. Um, on that note, <laughs> thanks for stopping by, audience. Thanks for watching and everything.